Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, welcome to the 2015 Caltech Space Challenge final presentations. Uh, very sorry for the delay, and thank you, everyone, for your patience. Uh, so my name is Jay Chi. I'm the technical lead and one of the student organizers of the Space Challenge, uh, along with uh, our two co-leads, uh, Hayden Burgoyne and Nicolas Simbolist. Uh, so first, I would like to thank the generous sponsors who uh, make this event possible. Uh, so Caltech, uh, the Graduate Aerospace Laboratories at California Institute of Technology, Galsit, uh, the Engineering Applied Science uh, at Caltech, <coughs> Northrop Grumman, uh, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, the Keck Institute for Space Studies, KISS, AGI, Lockheed Martin, SpaceX, Millennium Space Systems, and the Moore Hofstetter Fund uh, for the Enhancement of Student Life here at Caltech. So this challenge is in fact a competition between two teams, and so I'm gonna introduce you to our jurors. Uh, please uh, stand and wave when I read your name, and uh, please hold, for the interest of time, please hold your applause. <laughs> <laughs> until I'm, please hold your applause until I'm done with all 10. Um, so, first is, uh, so first is our head juror, Jacob Van Ziel, uh, Associate Director of Project Formulation and Strategy at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Uh, Tom Prince, Professor of Physics and the Director of the Keck Institute for Space Studies. Uh, Dennis Kochman, Assistant Professor of Aerospace at Galsit and the Graduate, uh, the graduate Aerospace Employees here at Caltech. Um, Gary Reisman, Director of Crew Operations at SpaceX and former NASA astronaut with 107 days of space. He had to uh, go get something and he's on his way back. Uh, Jackie, Jackie Gish, uh, Northrop Grumman Technology Fellow and Visiting Associate at Caltech here at Galsit. Um, Lou Friedman, Co-Founder and Executive Director Emeritus at the Planetary Society. <laughs> Sarah Gavitt, Spacecraft Systems Engineering and Project Management Consultant previously at Lockheed Martin and JPL. Craig Elder, Project Manager for the Eagle Spacecraft at Northrop Grumman. David Murrow, Business Development at Lockheed Martin. And David Smythe, NASA and Civil Space Development at Millennium Space Systems, and former software architect for the Mars rovers at JPL. And uh, thank you so much to our jurors for your time today uh, here at this event. Uh, everyone, please give them a round of applause. Next slide, please. And so, this is the challenge that we posed to our two teams this week. Uh, Assume that the asteroid redirect mission that NASA is planning right now uh, successfully returns 500 metric tons of C-type asteroid material uh, by 2024 to a distant retrograde lunar orbit with a mean radius of 61,500 kilometers. And so their challenge was, in five days, uh, design a mission to land humans on, an as on this asteroid brought back to lunar orbit, extract the asteroid's resources, and demonstrate their use. And so our two teams, Team Explorer and Team Voyager, have had five days to step up to this challenge and create a mission design concept. They have learned from speakers from JPL and the industry, received mentoring from previous Space Challenge participants and organizers, and had the opportunity to develop their design with JPL's A-team at the JPL Innovation Foundry. So what you will be seeing shortly is the culmination of their efforts this week. The format will be a 50-minute presentation followed by a 10-minute question period from the jurors. And uh, without further ado, Team Explorer will be presenting first. Feels like it's time to take a deep breath. <laughs> like we have finally arrived now, everything we've been working for. I have to tell you, it's a little bit scary, not because of you. It's very impressive, the people we have in the audience. But we put so much time and effort and discussion into this. We have a 115-page report. We have Excel sheets you will never see. So many figures you will never see. And you just we want to impress all this great stuff that we did. And so we're going to give this presentation. And we hope that the fact that we had a lot of fun, too, comes out. Because this really was a great week. So we are Project El Dorado. It's named because of the uh, sense of mining uh, the, the lunar asteroid. We came up with an acronym. It's really a backronym. Uh, but uh, the, really the focus is the asteroid and what can you do with it. And this is kind of the big picture. This is the takeaway slide. We're doing this because we want to go to Mars. 
the asteroid is a really fascinating topic. Uh, we've learned a lot more about asteroids than maybe some of us knew this week. Um, but really, the goal is Mars. And what can we do in terms of enabling technologies, enabling science, and just general operations on the ground, too, trying to figure out what do we need to do to get to Mars? We do have a mission statement uh, there at the top that you can read. But essentially, our goal was to uh, launch in 2025. And we're going to characterize, extract, utilize this asteroid, see how we can apply it to the future. I think. From the top level, our strengths, our three biggest strengths were trajectory analysis. We had three very smart people working that. We have a planetary geologist from Caltech, so the jurors from Caltech want to get bonus points for that. <laughs> yeah, very smart. You're going to hear some stuff, and again, I wish we could talk more about it. Uh, and then the third thing was the human factors in EQUIS. And we have people from JSC and people who are specializing it. Uh, they all three did amazing. I think those are three of our biggest strengths. Here's the executive summary. We're going to use two rockets, one for cargo uh, so we could take more science, and then one for crew. Uh, we launched in August 2024, and we're going to go on a ballistic trajectory, so it's going to be a slow burn. It's going to take us a number of months to get out there. Uh, then three-person crew launches in February and March, eight and a half days to get out there, 22 days of operations, eight and a half days back. and. Uh, we did take into account abort options. You won't see too much of that because of time. But a lot of our mass schedule budgets were driven by the ability to come back to the Earth. Uh, we do use Orion and SLX architecture. And it's roughly uh, 3.1 to $4 billion, uh, but 1.8 billion without the launch cost. It depends. There's a lot of you know, how much does SLS really cost. So the presentation flow, basically uh, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the foundation. You'll see a lot of numbers. You'll see how we got to where we are. And then we try to build on top of that, add the creativity. And this is really what happened this week, too. We spent a lot of time investing in the details, and then we started building on that foundation. So our foundation is very strong, and we had some really crazy, fun ideas. This is the table of contents. So we're going to talk about the context, the overview, get into that trajectory in science that we talked about, human factors. Those are our three core strengths. From system engineering, public outreach, the budget, conclusions. Okay, step one. Uh, here we are. We have this asteroid. We're going to spend billions of dollars on bringing this asteroid to the moon. A lot of people have an investment in what we do with this money. The government wants to know. Public wants to know. Scientists really want to know. We've done all this work, but now what? That's where we come in. And uh, so we have these critical ground rules and assumptions that we built from. Uh, they're broken into three sections. We have assumptions about the asteroid, assumptions about NASA, assumptions about the Earth, uh, things uh, like 500 metric tons for the asteroid designed for A or B. Uh, if you saw this week, maybe you saw that Congress says, well, it's going to be option B. Well, we didn't know that when we spent 48 hours and late nights. And so some of our things were option A, but we did make a, a heroic effort here, and we it's tailored for either, but we said we we're going to assume both. We're still on the table. Arm power, this is a big one. Arm has 50 kilowatts on it, and we said we're going to be able to access that somehow because you don't need it for propulsion anymore. NASA, block one and block B, we said those would be available. Block two, not so much. Now, if block two was available, we could do it in one launch instead of two. So that would be something that we could really leverage, but we said maybe it's not going to be available. And then on the Earth side, planetary protection. We thought about crazy stuff like, why don't we crash this asteroid into Mars and see what happens? But you know, that, that validates the uh, planetary protection, so we didn't do that. And public outreach uh, was very important. And that's a lot of where our fun discussions came from, too. OK, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Davi Day, and he's going to talk about the mission overview and the trajectory. Have fun. <laughs> Thank you, Bill. So, sorry, I have a little bit of a sore throat, and I can assure you it's not because we've been yelling at each other too much. Uh, well, we have a little bit. Uh, so this slide uh, shows you the main mission uh, phases, and so I'm going to guide you through uh, how uh, we plan to make El Dorado happen. As you can see uh, on the bottom, we have the timeline, obviously not the scale, and on the vertical axis we have Earth, low Earth orbit. We have the moon and the BRO, which is where our asteroid will be located. 
We started in August 2024 with our first launch, the cargo mission on the Falcon Heavy, and that will inject our uh, science module, Eureka, uh, into a low energy ballistic capture, which I will talk to you about a little bit uh, later. And in about uh, six months or so, we will be able to rendezvous and dock with the asteroid in a DRO, uh, spending virtually no uh, Delta V at the cost of time, obviously. Uh, later on, in February, March 2025, we have our second launch. Uh, the crew vehicle, Orion, will launch on top of the SLS Block 1B. And it'll perform the uh, translunar injection. And in about uh, eight and a half, nine days, we will be at the DRO uh, docked with the asteroid. 22 days of scientific exploration will follow, and you'll hear more about that later. After which, uh, the aero departure happens and Orion leaves um, the asteroid and the armed vehicle, comes back to Earth doing uh, again another fl lunar flyby and leaving uh, uh, the uh, inflatable habitat behind and then it will arrive back to Earth with the reentry velocity of about 11 kilometers per second and return as heroes, that's obviously important. Uh, we don't want to forget, as Bill said, that this is part of a greater aspect of the mission, which is to enable exploration of Mars. So I'd just like to read to you uh, that uh, couple of words from Carl Sagan. Uh, we come, after all, from hunter-gatherers, and for 99.9% .9 of our tenure on Earth, we've been wanderers. And the next place to wander is Mars. So let's not forget what the main objective of this mission is in the long run. So for the trajectory design, Marilena, Koki, and I uh, worked on uh, computing what the DRO for our specific mission looks like. We have an amplitude of about 61,500 kilometers. That's the X, uh, uh, so-called X location altitude. And notice that uh, this also gives us the period of the DRO, which is very critical, but a little bit over 11 days. And the amplitude plus the, time the period of the orbit gives us uh, stability um, assessment. We can make stability assessments, which you can see on the right. And based on various models, this uh, chart shows you uh, various uh, perturbations that were taken into account. Uh, but even taking into account all the possible perturbations, that's the black bar on the right, our DRO is stable. There has been some discussion, but uh, we're also uh, assuming that uh, uh, NASA will bring an asteroid back into a stable orbit. Next, please. As Bill mentioned, we will uh, have two different launches, and that will require two different launch vehicles. Uh, the first one will be a Falcon Heavy. Uh, we estimated that the PLI payload mass will be a little bit less than 18 tons, but that's enough for our science module, or Eureka. And uh, successfully, we'll have uh, the second launch, which will be done by an SLS Block 1B uh, that has a payload to uh, TLI, TLI means translunar injection, by the way, uh, of about 47 tons, uh, taking Orion into the DRO wave we discussed. Yeah, next, please. So let's look at the trajectory for Eureka. Now, this is the unmanned mission, uh, part of the mission, and so we don't have specific time constraints, uh, aside from the fact that our mission needs to take place between 2024 and 2028. Therefore, we made use of this so-called low-energy ballistic capture, which you can see uh, depicted on, on, the, on the left at various uh, inclinations and points of view. Uh, this gives us uh, uh, theoretically zero delta V, but uh, we also need to take into account some launch cleanup uh, on about 15 meters per second and rendezvous and docking again 15 meters per second. Now, this is only a total of about 30 meters per second, which can be performed by the attitude control system on board of Eureka. Next, please. We also looked into uh, options for the crew mission. Uh, we boiled it down to three uh, main options. As you can see, this is the direct transfer uh, from Earth to a DRO. Then we have the prograde powered lunar gravity assist, a little bit more complicated, and the retrograde powered uh, gravity assist. Uh, the Delta V is in time of flight are summarized in this table here. And as you can see, there's a trade-off between Delta V and time of flight. 
And as a good compromise, we decided to go with the middle option, the <coughs> prograde power lunar gravity assist, both for the outbound and inbound trajectory. And so this is, a, as I said, uh, the prograde uh, lunar flyby trajectory. Here we have a breakdown of delta Vs and uh, the time at which they happen. So uh, for both the outbound trajectory and the inbound trajectory, and we come up with a total delta V of a little bit over one kilometer per second. Uh, but keep in mind that Orion is designed to have an available delta V of 1.3-ish kilometers per second. So, and, and this also takes into account uh, abort uh, options, which we can discuss further after the presentation if you wish. Next, please. Additionally, another requirement was to pick a launch date. And because of that, uh, we uh, decided to uh, look at the uh, Moon Earth ephemeris, and we realized that the inclination of the Moon, Moon's orbit with respect to the Earth changes with time. Uh, and so there is an optimal time or an optimal uh, launch window uh, during which the mission should happen to uh, reduce delta V. Now the optimal date would be uh, around February, March, April-ish of 2025, but we virtually have a two year period from uh, 1st of January 2024. That is to uh, reduce the delta V due to inclina possible inclination changes. Now here we made the assumption that <coughs> Excuse me. We're launching from KSC, uh, Kennedy Space Center, uh, which is at a uh, latitude of about 28.5 degrees. Additionally, we took into account the radiation environment, very critical for missions beyond low Earth orbit. And so if you look at the solar uh, activity uh, as, a, as, a as a function of time, we see that the solar maximum happens right around our crew launch right here, which corresponds to uh, a minimum in radiation dosage. Uh, of uh, uh, which the Eclipse system will uh, discuss later. <coughs> Excuse me. So as I said, we, we also have another, uh, this is not so much a requirement, but uh, an optimal uh, launch would also happen when the moon is uh, closer to the Earth, uh, minimizing time of flight and delta V. Now that uh, minimization is very small, um, but it could uh, make a little bit of a difference. So it, it would be like for the lunar when the when the moon is at Fairy G. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Mathieu, our science guy. <laughs> Thank you, Davide. Um, so I am going to uh, walk you through and give you a brief overview of both the science and technology demonstration phase that will be performed while at the asteroid during uh, Mission El Dorado. Our science and tech demonstration objectives directly respond to uh, questions raised in the second uh, planetary science decadal survey and the uh, strategic knowledge gap. Our main science objectives are to quantify the composition of the asteroid and characterize surface processes, probe the internal structure of the asteroid and characterize the water phases as well as detecting and identifying organic compounds such as methane or even amino acids. Now our main technology demonstration objectives are in situ excavation of small body material and again in situ here is very important. Uh, we're going to excavate enough rocks to produce a, a minimum of five kilograms of water. In situ extraction of the water, uh, separation of the oxides and to demonstrate the utilization of the extracted material, we are going to fly a steam rocket, ex uh, extract hydrogen and oxygen from the asteroid derived water, sinter some regolith material, dry regolith material, perform radiation and thermal shielding experiment, and perform uh, experiments with an experimental garden. Next slide. Uh, and before I dig into the detail of the science payload and uh, hand it over for the tech demo payload, and I'm going to walk you through our operations plan. We have 22 days at the asteroid, and the days here on the slide refer to the days after the arrival at the, the asteroid. On the first day, we're giving time for the astronauts to adapt to their new environment. On day two, we begin breathing protocol to have our first EVA on day three. During the first EVA, um, we are going to set up a science drill 
collect surface samples using uh, chisel in the cup technology that is manually operated and install a pyrolysis chamber to uh, extract water from the regolith. During day, days four, five, six, and seven, we are going to test and analyze the surface samples. And during all these days, the science drill will be uh, operating autonomously on the asteroid. On day seven, we begin breathing protocol to uh, start our second EVA on day eight, during which we will operate the, plas the plasma drill to extract a large quantity of asteroid material collect the science core from the science drilling campaign and load the pyrolysis chamber. During days nine and 10, uh, we are going to analyze some samples coming from the bulk material at depth in the asteroid. And the pyrolysis is going to be autonomously operating on the asteroid between days eight and our 30 VA on day 15. Uh, now on days 11, 12, we are are going to prepare and test our uh, in situ experiment of radiation shielding. Next slide, please. Yes. Jessica, is it okay to ask a question? Uh, yeah. Let's yeah. wait for the end. Okay. Yeah, yeah please wait until the end. Okay. <laughs> um, so on the 15th day, we have our 30 VA, during which we will collect the pyrolysis end product sinter the dry material that comes out of the pyrolysis chamber, uh, set up our shielding experiment, both thermal and, and uh, radiation shielding, load the steam rocket, and deploy um, spheres to characterize the surface autonomously once we leave the asteroid. The rest of, during the rest of the, the mission, the shielding experiments will um, be autonomously, no, the shielding experiments will be autonomously uh, acquiring data on the asteroid. On day 16, we will purify water and uh, start the experimental garden that will be working through day 16 to after we leave the Eureka module. On day 17, we will fly the steam rocket and perform electrolysis to get the hydrogen and the oxygen out of the asteroid water. On day 18, we will separate the oxides. Day 19, uh, 20 and 21, we keep an analyzing the, the samples. And on day 29, to reward the astronauts, we're gonna produce some astronaut sorbet derived from uh, the asteroid water. And finally, on day 22, uh, the astronauts will pack and dispose of the extra rock samples and that will be left behind in the science module, in the Eureka module. There is more science to be done for Earth. We're bringing back about 100 kilos of, of uh, rock minimum to Earth for absolute dating purposes, isotopic studies, uh, studies of space weathering, and further characterization of the oxides, silicates, and metals. So I'm now going to go into a little bit more details about the primary instru instruments for the science payload, and they come in seven flavors. The first flavor is the imaging payload. Uh, we are going to bring a higher resolution camera, uh, multispectral, a mi microscopic imager, the mineralogy payload with an active hyperspectral visible near infrared spectrometer, an uh, X-ray dif uh, diffraction device, uh, our sampling um, payload with a coring drill, and the chisel and cup technology chemistry payload with the alpha particle X-ray spectrometer, radiation payload with the radiation detectors, structure payload with the density neutron and gamma ray probe that will be uh, deployed in the borehole and uh, thermocouples, and finally our organics payload with the uh, GCMS, a gas chromatography mass spectrometer. And here I'm going to hand this into Lee. Matt, can you stay here? I need to get the power supply. Thank you, you Matt. Right, so once we've extracted the ore from the asteroid, uh, we place it within a wire mesh or carrier. From this, we insert into a pyrolysis chamber. Now, connected to this pyrolysis chamber, there's a small container filled with water, which we then open. The water uh, leaves this container and immediately vaporizes upon contact with the vacuum, sort of creating water vapor around here. Uh, we then have a circulation propeller, uh, so we sort of cause heat transfer between the walls and the ore carrier. Uh, and the reason is because we heat this chamber with resistance heaters around the outside. We did look at using microwave technology 
and parabolic mirrors. Uh, but these had both safety concerns and a, a much larger setup time required. Um, so once we heat this, uh, the ore, and the water starts to outgas, the pressure increases to one atmosphere, and then a small pressure valve here will open, uh, allowing water vapour to flow into the condensation chamber, uh, which is held at 10 degrees Celsius, and after a while, liquid water will before, begin to form there. Uh, we will, uh, once we have enough volatiles, we will then take this chamber off and use a centrifuge to separate out the different volatiles and in particular water. Right. Next slide, please. Yeah, we have a battery to show you. Okay. Uh, right. So some of the exciting things we're going to do with this water, in one case, is to use it in a steam rocket. So we effectively take it directly out of the centrifuge uh, and place some, some sort of partially purified water uh, into this rocket. And so this is a, a very rugged, simple engine. Uh, and the advantage with this is that it you sort of take concentrated sunlight to, to vaporize the asteroid water. So it's going to give you sort of a low ISP, uh, possibly on the order of 40 seconds. Uh, but, but as I said, it's, it's good for on and near asteroid operations because of its simplicity and because the fuel is easy to store as ice. And so when you're doing sort of local operations nearby, this, is, this can be uh, an important asset. Uh, as Matt mentioned, uh, another experiment we'll be doing is sort of shoveling in regular into these sandbags and then testing the radiation properties. Next slide. Uh, towards the end of the mission, we will be releasing some sphere-derived sphere uh, sort of swarm robots float around. Uh, and this is to sort of act as a field test to see how well this technology does in mapping the topology of the asteroid. Uh, it'll need to be improved slightly from what we currently have on the space station at the moment, uh, so it can operate in unconstrained vacuum environments. But in addition to being a good field test, this is also a great potential for uh, outreach. Next slide. So now I'll, uh, well, now I'll be passing you over to Alex. We'll be talking to you about other uh, utilization technologies we'll be dealing with. Thanks, Lee. So we're having a battery issue. I believe that uh, Bill just went to get his charger. <laughs> um, if you want to ask a question now, I guess would be a good time. Uh, okay. Uh, so the, the question I had was, um, in the timeline you had, you have one day for acclimation once they reach the asteroid. this question to uh, my uh, EVA specialist here, Chris. So yeah, so um, we're planning on um, leaving the um, orbit when it's at the best point to use the lowest of B. So we're going to be there in 22 days no matter what. Um, so we want to start the pre-breathe. We want to just, um, we just have the extra days available. So we decided that would be the best option um, to just do the pre-breathe the day before, or the second day, and then do it again the, the first again the third day. So if you had an extra two days of crew time, Sorry for the delay. Okay. Uh, so for continuing, while well, Lee was talking about uh, the things that we're gonna do back there, uh, I'm talking about the sintering processes and also the experimental garden. Now, sintering uh, is basically the process of putting together granulose material without having to melt it before 
thus using less uh, temperature and less power, and yet having something, uh, some hard concrete material in the end that can be used especially for heat shielding. And so it is a very uh, promising thing. If it works, uh, it's estimated that billions of dollars will be saved in producing heat shields in situ. And for our mission, our, uh, the idea is basically that we extract a uh, regolith, we are going to crush it with our crusher, and then using sunlight, in this case we can actually use a uh, solar mirror, which in our case we have, ex we have um, assumed to have like three, zero, three meters squared. We can actually uh, synthesize small samples of about, small cubes of about two centimeters per two centimeters and one centimeter, and in 10 minutes. And so with that, we can actually uh, experiment on these to verify their various different properties um, for example, the uh, heat conduction, which is supposed to be now very different from before. And this is actually one experiment that we are, we are performing in the asteroid by using our thermocouples and verifying after the sintering process is over, uh, basically how much, how temperature varies with time. For other uh, experiments, for example, uh, material strength or electrical conductivity, we are bringing these small samples back home. As they are very small, we are thinking now we're producing about 10, and this number, of course, might change uh, if you verify various uh, different properties. Um, let's race. Another experiment, which is one that I think is one of the most exciting, is the idea of an experimental garden. Now, our basic idea is very simple. We start with four plants, which are going to be lettuce for serious reasons, uh, and we are going to put so these eight plants, and we're planting them in different aspects. We take half of them and plant them in regolith material, and half of them in earth material. And then we are gonna water them with different waters. Half of them is going to be with uh, water extracted from the asteroid, and the other half with water brought from Earth. So we have a, a very broad group, and also a control group, and we can verify during the about one week, one and a half week period that we have, uh, how the growth is gonna be. Lettuce is good, uh, because first of all, lettuce has a very high bio-edible mass, it means we can actually eat a lot from the material that is created, and it's also ha it also has a reasonably uh, quick growth, going from a small seed to a, to a uh, baby green in like about one week. Yes, next please. So I'm just starting to talk a little bit of the communication before passing, uh, passing the floor. Uh, we are talking about after all that is done, what are we left with? And to start with, we have the 50 kilowatt uh, power of, the, of our mission that we can use for various purposes, in particular for communication. Not also that, if we have uh, an asteroid which is actually capable of giving us water and minerals and metal, we can use it as a resource depot in space. Finally, uh, if we still have this this kind of little um, station that is there. We can also use the fact that it has a small, uh, the gravity well is not going to be so steep in there to have a uh, safe home in case we need to abort any kind of moon or Mars mission. And finally, as we also have, a, uh, if we, we can implement a wireless power drive, um, essentially, for CubeSats, for example, which are missions around the moon. So now I'll give the word to Anna, which is going to talk about human factors. Hi everyone, I will be discussing the eclipse and human factors related designs for El Dorado. We, for our crew selection, we have chosen two scientists and one engineer. Since the bulk of our mission is going to involve experimentation with science uh, at the asteroid, we have two scientists and an engineer to address all hardware and electrical uh, capabilities. And all of our crew members will be medically trained. Our crew members will be chosen based off of um, aptitude, their communication, and uh, their skill set. And we will be training them for, we'll be training them for psychological and group building activities. A space environment has a negative toll on the human body, especially in the cardiovascular, muscular, and skeletal systems. To address the majority of the deconditioning that arises from muscular, from the, in the muscular and skeletal systems, we have incorporated the rotary MR damper, which is a cyclic 
resistive device uh, that is currently being developed for incorporation in compact spaces. So we have decided to include this in the Orion capsule into the seats where the astronauts will be, uh, will be located. Uh, the, and another important design consideration that we have had to make have to make is the uh, design consideration with radiation levels. We will be traveling to the, through the Van Allen belts and we will be traveling at a solar maximum. So we will have a minimal amount of GCR exposure, but there is a probability of SPEs. Also, our mission duration is more than a month, meaning that we will uh, be outside of the, uh, the astronauts, the moon will be outside of the Earth's magnetosphere. So we had to take this into account designing our radiation protection. To protect from uh, large amounts of radiation that can arise from solar particle events, we have uh, made water walls. We have incorporated a pressurized water membrane into, the, into our science module, which we refer to as Eureka. And in Eureka, we will also the, uh, have a communication system that will relay back information from the GO satellites about X-rays, which will warn us when SPEs are about to arise. The Orion is also capable of um, protecting our astronauts through radiation levels. Here we have uh, made some schematics about the Orion air revitalization system and the thermal control system. There are no specific uh, schematics available online. We have designed these schematics based off the literature that we have found. Uh, the air revitalization system, some important things to note would be the uh, the human <coughs> release system as well as the cabin air system. The cabin air system uh, has a cameras, a CO2 and moisture removal system uh, that is amine based and it is compact and uh, power efficient. The human in the loop system um, has, so this is the air revitalization system is um, based for the suit. The Orion active thermal control system, a major component in this to note would be the heat exchanger that is uh, getting cool air from the service module and the, uh, the cooling plates and it's being used to cool the components in the Orion as well as um, the liquid cooling garment system. Here we have designed a <coughs> uh, independent air revitalization system for our, um, for Eureka. And this has taken into account a Sabatier reactor which is a CO2 removal system. Uh, trace contaminant control, uh, atmospheric revitalization pressure control system modeled after the ISS. And um, the Sabatier was chosen over other alternative designs for CO2 removal based off of high TRL, high efficiency, uh, scale, scalability, and availability. So our atmospheric monitoring and regulation system, as I discussed before, involves the Sabatier chosen over the Bosch and lithium hydroxide systems. We have a we have non-regenerable O2 generation. Since our mission is of short duration, we are going to be taking all of our consumables with us, so we will not be generating oxygen. And a um, and for our fire detection and suppression system, something to note would be that we plan to include the JPL E nose, an electronic nose that is a sensor suite that mimics the mammalian nose to uh, detect um, detect volatiles and uh, trace contaminants in the atmosphere to warn astronauts. Demonstrations for future ECLIS missions, um, ECLIS res reservoirs. So a primary goal of our mission is to demonstrate that we can have uh, ECLIS reservoirs for future astronauts on their way to the moon or Mars. So some experiments related to ECLIS would be incorporating the uh, vapor phase catalytic ammonia removal system that is going to be used for water recovery. This was compared with the water re recovery system on the ISS as well as a personalized forward osmosis bag and this system was specifically chosen also because of its TRL efficiency, the uh, scale of water that it can uh, purify. And this will be directly really, uh, used with the water that we're obtaining from the asteroid to see if we can make potable water from it. Uh, another experiment that we will have is the uh, oxygen generation with hydrogen byproducts using a solid polymer electrolyte water electrolysis. This system is based off of the oxygen generation assembly on the ISS. It's just a scaled down version to see if we can get hydrogen and oxygen from the water that we produce. Next. Now I'll be handing it off to Chris to discuss the IVA and EVA suit design. Thanks, Anna. Um, I'll be briefly talking about our IVA and EVA suit selection. A um, couple things when looking at IVA suits is you know it's going to be used for launch and reentry and emergency, um, emergency such as cabin depressurization. So it's a couple different factors. A couple different 
suits available or in development right now that meet these requirements. So first is the ACE suit um, that was introduced during the shuttle missions. Um, it, is a, it is the advanced crew escape suit. And like I said, it's for launch and reentry purposes and for any cabin depressurization that would occur during launch um, or during the mission. And the current TR level, that is nine. Um, it has been flight proven through many missions. Um, we see that the mass is a little bit higher than that of the Mesa suit, which is the other suit we were looking at, which is the modified ACE suit, which is currently in development. It's a TRR level six. Um, it has been tested in MBL test and vacuum chamber testing. So it is being proven right now. It's expected to be a TRR level eight by 2021. Um, we said the mass of the Mesa suit is a little bit lower than the um, Asa suit. Um, we also see that the vehicle design fit for the Mesa suit is meant to be for the Orion vehicle. That's what their overall goal is. Um, so this is specifically designed for the closed loop life support system, um, which is preferred in our case for this mission. And then we also see that um, the Mesa suit is currently working on EVA capability. So this suit could be able to handle EVA um, in vacuum environments. Uh, we do, the cost is a little bit unknown for us for the Mesa suit, but we will be going with the uh, Mesa suit for the IVA as it is designed for this um, vehicle and mission. Next. And then EVA suits, there's a couple different factors to look at. Um, the EVA suits obviously need to handle the harsh atmosphere, uh, vacuum, thermal, micrometeorite protection that you see in space in the vacuum. Currently, there is one suit that has been flight proven, and that is the EMU, the extra vehicle mo mobility unit, which has been used and is currently being used on the ISS. Um, it's a TRL level nine, it's flight proven. Um, we see that the life support system is the primary life support system that has been um, available since the EMU has come out. Uh, the nominal EVA time for that is about six and a half to eight hours. Um, we see the mobility of the EMU suit is moderate compared to the other suits as it has a lot of joint mobility in the upper torso and arm area, but the legs not so much. Um, the next suit we're looking at for e EVA is the Mesa suit. Um, same on the last slide. We've used this as our, as our IVA suit and as a contingency for the EVA suit as well. As we see, it's currently a TRL level seven for EVA capability, has been, as it has been demonstrated in neutral buoyancy laboratory tests as well as vacuum chamber testing. We see the suit mass of this suit is very light compared to the, compared to the other ones, and this would utilize the PLIS 3.0 technology, which um, currently being developed as the PLIS 2.0, which is um, the new life support system, um, and PLUS 3.0 is in design right now, and that will be the flight-capable and flight-proven model for life support. And the nominal EVA for that life support system is about eight to 10 hours, um, so it gives much more EVA time for astronauts. And we see the mobility of that suit is low, though, as it is designed for a launch and reentry suit. There is more capability than the um, old ACES suit, but it's still limited in the upper torso and legs area. Um, the suit we did decide to choose was the Z3Z series exploration suit, which is the suit that NASA is advertising as its future exploration suit um, and future Mars exploration suit. Um, this TRL level is a little bit lower than the other ones. It has been demonstrated in relevant environments uh, based on the Z1 suit that is currently being tested and the Z2 suit that is currently being received by JSC um, to begin testing next year. By 2022, they expect the Z3 suit to be a TRL level nine, as it will be sent up to the ISS with the police plus 3.0 life support system and tested during various EVAs. Um, the nominal EVA time as the Mesa suit would utilize is eight, eight to 10 hours, which gives more time for um, astronauts to be outside in the vacuum environment and do tests they need to do, which would also limit the amount of EVAs needed. Um, the mobility for this suit is very high. There is joint, lots of joint capabilities in the arms and legs allow astronauts to bend down, um, pick things up and move around a lot easier than the other suits which would be great to test um, during this asteroid mission and test the suit outside of low Earth orbit before sending this suit to Mars or other environments. Next. Now I'm gonna pass, it, pass it off to Dan to talk about systems engineering. Thank you, Chris. So uh, we're going uh, back a little bit in time this week. <clears throat> of course, we saw all these great ideas already and the great system design that we had. And to make sure that with all these good ideas and all the design we wanted to implement and to try. We had to make sure, of course, that we stay on track, that we don't over-design. And um, so we came up with these functional objectives first and um, then derived from the functional objectives the children requirements, which could then be directly applied to the subsystems, as I said, to make sure that we actually meet the mission. Next slide, please. Um, the entire team worked very hard to come up with good estimates of what we actually need. So you can see we need a total mass of uh, 54 tons launched to orbit. 36.8 um, of that is going to be launched on the SLS. 
and 70.2 is going to be launched on the Falcon Heavy. Um, we have a little bit of margin on the SLS here. We thought it's not a bad idea because the rocket has not been tested yet. There's no prototype for it. <coughs> and um, there might be changes here and there's also a chance to include secondary payloads um, for further outreach in this mission. Next slide, please. Um, we also need, of course, a lot of energy for this mission, for all the equipment, the life support systems. Um, we were going with the assumption that the Orion is basically as is, um, plus margins. And um, so this, this uh, diagram of our power budget concentrates really on the Orion situation. Um, and you can see that once we arrive at the asteroid, uh, the Eureka arrives first, we have a power boost due to the availability of the arm. So we have an, uh, an additional 50 kilowatts. The Orion arrives later, um, goes then into kind of a quiescent mode as it's being supported by the, by the additional habitat. And you can see that uh, our total available power um, is good, but we have peaks that we have to cover with uh, batteries. And those batteries are also included in the design of the Eureka. And that is mostly due to our science operations and the drill that takes a uh, takes up a lot of power. Okay, next slide please. Um, of course, it's, uh, this mission is uh, very risky as something like that has never been attempted. So we try to identify risks, uh, rank them according to this NASA standard, and then especially um, for the high risk levels, so high probability or high consequences, um, come up with mitigation strategies, and of course employ redundancies wherever uh, we can and reduce all critical risks to a loss of mission at most and not a loss of crew. And there's just an example here, number 10, um, the partial failure of a critical system shortly after the translunar injection. If we don't have a mitigation strategy, this could mean a loss of crew, but uh, our trajectory people came up with a solution and our entire mission is designed so that we have enough delta V and we have enough possibilities to come back to Earth in time with uh, our uh, suits to protect us. Um, next slide, please. Um, you already saw that we're using an inflatable habitat. Uh, we had a trade trade off here and decided to go with the inflatable for various reasons. It's more available volume with a lower mass, um, uh, better radiation protection because we have no secondary radiation. We based it mostly on the NASA transhub studies and the bigger low, a little bit more on the transhub because there's more data <coughs> available. Um, we interpolated our structural mass from them, and this is designed to augment the Orion capability. So the mission would not be a complete failure if we have a puncture of the hull, for example. We would have to shorten it, but we could still do science experiments and perform EVAs to get equipment out here. And you can see that uh, the living space is uh, a little restricted by all the equipment that we have to bring, but that's all the gas we need to pressurize the volume that is uh, our science equipment, that is part of the life support system. And we said here is basically the area that is shielded by an additional skin filled with water um, against SPEs when we leave the magnetosphere um, or yeah, um, in general, if there's any event that could become dangerous. Next slide. Uh, we also try to make sure that all of our payloads fit in our rockets. <laughs> You can see on the left for the Orion and the service module, it was not that big of a problem. We said, okay, we think that NASA manages to do that, that it actually fits the way they want it to. So we have additional space down here, and as we said, we took that basically as a margin um, in the design set. If there is enough, a lot of space and more uh, mass left, we can use this as an outreach opportunity, include satellites from universities. We've been on the first flight to an asteroid, stuff like this. And we also made sure that our deflated habitat actually fits into the Falcon Heavy uh, fairing, and you can see it fits very nicely. Next slide. Yeah, and with this, uh, I'll give back to Bill. <laughs> okay, we're gonna swing around. I think we just have a couple minutes left. Uh, public outreach, these are just four ideas. We literally, literally had dozens of ideas. Uh, space selfies, so the concept here is we put a green screen in front of the asteroid. Uh, we take a couple pictures, some with the moon behind it, some with not. The public can upload a picture to a website, and then they can have safe, uh, space selfies uh, with the asteroid itself. Uh, we talked about this orbit. We have this great water processing system. We have water. Why not do something fun? We've talked about maybe making a lemonade or the sorbet. It's kind of a fun thing. 
And it also really demonstrates the potential of these asteroids if you can make sorbet from them. Uh, armchair astronauts, uh, a lot of you have heard from Kerbal Space Program. Uh, so you already had the ARM mission duplicated in there, but now we can take it to the next level and you can duplicate the entire part of our mission uh, in software. And of course, CubeSats, which we think is really powerful to be able to say we'll take a CubeSat to the moon uh, for you. Uh, we did do a Facebook page. This is just an example of what social media can do with Twitter. Everyone knows the astronauts have Twitter and a lot of people follow them. We created a page. Uh, it was picked up by the Space Generation Advisory Council. It was talked about in the International Space University. And then uh, at last count, we were at 1,500 plus people had visited the page and interacted with it. Okay, the budget. Uh, if you say the launch costs, you know, 2.2 billion, more or less, rough. Uh, you know, it hasn't been built and it's hard to get numbers out of NASA exactly how much a shuttle launch cost, let alone how much something that hasn't, built, uh, that hasn't been built yet. And this one looks like it got cut off somehow, but the 1.8 billion is what we expect for the science side of the mission. Okay, conclusions. Two rockets, three astronauts, 39 days. Measure, treasure, and pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> Science, equalization, and outreach. And we should be having fun too, right? This is really the theme, our theme of this week was cats, so we're putting this in for our own amusement. Uh, but we really did have a lot of fun this week, and uh, seriously, we do want to say thank you. Uh, we put all these sponsors up in the front slide as well, but also to the mentors, uh, Hayden and uh, Jay and Nico and Dimity, who is not here, uh, were amazing. We have. Uh, uh, we had a lot of fun. This is a very valuable experience for us, and we know that you worked many late nights even before we met you, uh, and we have a deep appreciation for that. And that is it. So uh, we are assuming that the asteroid has been characterized in some detail, at least the surface. Uh, we are assuming that we have a good knowledge of the topography to identify potential uh, um, hazards, uh, for example. Uh, that we have good knowledge of the uh, gra uh, gravity field, potential mag uh, magnetic field. Uh, we assume that the surface mineralogy was mapped into some detail with the uh, visible near infrared spectrometer. And uh, 
And so these are the basic requirements. And also, uh, we would like to have a ground penetrating radar that is fixed on the arm during the arm phase of the mission, uh, while during the capture phase, while the asteroid is still spinning, so that you could essentially get a profile, uh, a depth profile of the asteroid, measuring difference in resistivities and potentially locating where the ice is if there is some ice. Yeah, that, that was going to be my next question. Was do you think that uh, I was just doing a couple calculations on how big 500 metric tons of so 500 metric tons. Uh, if it's a um, sphere, it's about right. six meters, right? The gravity yeah, is it's three three point seven for a carbon nature spawn right. Uh, we're assuming that it's probably not a sphere because it's an asteroid. It's pretty small. Uh, but basically, so maximum depth that you would get is like four meters, uh, which uh, is enough to uh, find maybe trace amounts of ice. Definitely yeah, not yeah, close to the surface because of you know space gardening, uh, space weathering, all of these processes, but. Even if we don't have ice, we can still extract water from the hydrogen phases, either in the form of adsorbed water in the phytosilicates or in the form of hydroxyl groups in the phase. Yeah, I wanted to see if you guys had done the math to say how much sorbet could you make. <laughs> <laughs> so, because my 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 calculations say it's not even going to be a spoonful. So the we are calculating on a minimum of one percent uh, uh, water by weight. Whether the water, the water comes from ice or adsorbed water or hydroxyl, and then and then it's a minimum. Yeah. Okay, thank you for looking into that. That's good. This is what I kind of liked the best was we had this technical wizardry and we thought about so big. <laughs> Dave. So uh, just think a lot of great ideas. Thinking about uh, more ideas, um, if you had uh, or what would you choose? Would you rather have more time to do your mission or more crew? And can you talk a little bit about? how you might extend the mission if you had either more time or more crew. I'll put this one to Hannah. You want to take this one? So um, if we were to extend our mission, then right now our crew selection was based off of our EVA operation and who we needed to do the task. The fact that the Orion is going to be depressurized will be really so will not. Um, and the two astronauts will be going into Orion to uh, get ready for EVA operation means that we would cur we currently want one astronaut in Eureka to be doing to run to be running the science experiments. So if the crew if the duration was extended um, and we can accomplish more experiments as well as work and um, any other uh, engineering research we wanted to do in Eureka, then we could add another astronaut um, in Eureka as well. But what we're limited by is the fact that we are depressurizing Orion separately. Um, so some considerations that we would definitely take into account would also be the, uh, the habitable volume that we have. The Eureka that Eureka is designed for, it actually has about 38 meters squared of habitable volume, which is more than enough for, uh, more than enough for the four astronauts if we were to look at. So I base a lot of that habitable volume off of a baseline of the Selen Hano curve, which gives you mission duration versus a crew member, habitable volume per crew member. So uh, all of these design considerations would definitely be taken into account. But Eureka is capable of sending additional astronauts if we were to extend the duration of um, our mission. Great. Any other questions? I, I have uh, a discrep data discrepancy question. Yeah. up at the top, so bear with me as I... This one? Yes. What size, how much sample you would return? That's another map question. So, uh, again, we are set up to bring a minimum of 100 kilos of, of, of rock. Uh, 
and we can bring more competitors. But why would you try to manage that? This question is for Jan. Yeah. Um, it's actually, uh, Orion is designed to bring 100 kilograms of samples back. That's the design baseline. So since we can't really fiddle with the re-entry uh, mass, uh, we have to be careful with fiddling with the re-entry mass. We set 100 kilograms uh, at least based on the NASA information. And if NASA decides to extend those capabilities or tells us that it's possible, then of course we will try to bring back more. And also we have the capability of uh, mining a lot more. We are actually planning on uh, digging about 300 kilos, up to 500 kilos of material. Uh, and then pack it, leave it behind on uh, the Eureka module. Yeah, Dave. So you mentioned that um, you were agnostic to whether it was A or B, and I know that B was sort of chosen this week, but just a thought exercise. Um, how would you get through the bag? The bag has openings on it. It has square patches that make it crazy look fancy here. Yeah, so, um, so how it's designed right now and how they plan to do it for the current Arctic mission is to take crew outside and there's gonna be tether points along the bag and the crew would essentially cut um, three sides of the square out of the bag and then flip that open, do their work whenever they're done, close that flap and then seal it back up using the caps on the tape for the ties. So, so uh, just a knife? Yeah, I mean, I mean, there's obviously gonna be some restrictions. They have to figure out how they're gonna cut the Kevlar. Um, a knife is what I've heard. Obviously there's some, there has to be some safety factor to it um, and some hazards associated with warnings in the EBA procedures. So, uh, what assumptions have been made about the cohesiveness of the material of the asteroid? I mean, it, uh, depending on how cohesive it is, how solid it is, that makes a big difference about our drills, digging, extracting material. So, uh, this is part of our assumptions. We assume that the uh, asteroid has been mapped, at least we have visible images of it, so we can assess the degree of, uh, you know, of cohesiveness, at least of the surface. Uh, the gra the uh, gravity field also will tell us something about the, the distribution of the mass. And so right now the plasma drill uh, is what enable, uh, en enables us to you know, drill through hard rock, cohesive rock, but we have uh, our uh, scientific drill that has the capability of drilling into more granular material and also the chisel makeup technology which and, and scoops that we're bringing with us that you know, which allow us to deal with a more, more uh, less cohesive material. And also, obviously, we don't know whether the surface or the interior uh, are <coughs> the same, but the, during the scientific drill campaign, which is the first phase of the mission, uh, we are, the, the drill is non-destructive, and so we are preserving the ball holes, preserving the core, and as we deploy the drill, we are measuring with an, uh, gamma ray, neutron, uh, porosity, and, uh, and density uh, probes that are currently used in the oil industry to measure up to a skin depth of about 50 to 60 centimeters what is the porosity and the hydrogen content around the ball hole to get a better idea of the internal structure of the cohesion and porosity. Do we have time for one more question? Uh, one more final question. How, how did you decide to package the material that you bring back? This is a question for Raul. Where is Raul? Uh, Raul, you can just stand up. Yeah. Did you hear the question? Yeah, I did. Okay, so obviously depending on uh, what point of the trajectory some system fails or not, uh, you're going to have different return times. The easiest one would be if TLI fails or partially or completely, uh, so that would be at Earth, uh, that would be probably the quickest way. Um, but I believe, uh, and that's in the report, but um, if I remember correctly, if we 
failed DRO, DRO injection uh, and or the uh, flyby of the moon, depending how much we, you know, that has failed, that may take up to even 40 days to get back. So that's a lot, lot of missions. Um, we don't have lots of crew, uh, as long as we have some sort of propulsion system that we can use to correct our turn. Now, so, yeah, the depress on that during that trajectory. Yeah. Uh, how do you, how do you survive? Right. Uh, well, if you have a deep press, I guess it depends how bad it is, uh, because. <laughs> In fact, Chris is raising his hand. He must have an answer for the sure, EVA suit. It's a bit time. Yeah. So the um, so the Mesa suit, the current EVA suit, um, is currently designed to be um, would to be able to um, sustain the crew using the consumables on board in case there's heavy depressurization for the longest return time there. So obviously, there's twenty two days. No food, no water, no hygiene. Obviously, the food and the bathroom, everything, that's something still to be worked out. Um, but as far as air, <laughs> and air, 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 and water, and the hygiene. Uh, the issue of time, would your crew survival strategy have been better if the Orion and the Eureka habitat went together, if you had that as a resource? Uh, yeah, uh, actually consider that. Uh, that would be able if we had, uh, we could use the SS block too. Uh, but uh, we did not decide to go for that option because apparently uh, SS Block 1 and 1B are the priority for NASA right now, and Block 2 may or may not be available. But obviously, if that is an option, I think that Block 2 would be our best choice and just go in, in one way. Okay. Okay, I'll stop there. Thanks. Okay, so uh, real quick, let's have uh, Team Explorer all come up. So